This is an Ender 3. Looks kind of sad, I guess. Fallen out of favour, maybe? Shall we take it to bits? Shall we look at these things? Go on then, let's go. So Big Tree Tech kindly sent me this board and these drivers to review. That's really cool because they are new. I don't know if you follow 3D printing news, but this is the latest thing. Old drivers look like this with all the legs and stuff, and they were incredibly com well, they were so common they were all drivers looked like this if they weren't surface mounted. But the new ones look like tiny sticks of RAM. I like how they're also keyed so you can't put them in backwards. So I asked you all in a poll whether you want me to put Clipper or Marlin on this thing, and obviously both won by a slim margin. I, I knew it would. I was expecting everyone to say both. But I reckon you probably really want to see Clipper. So I did Marlin. Nah, I'm kidding. I did both. But bear in mind that this is a speedrun, and hilariously, it's the first time I've compiled Marlin, and it's the first time I've ever used Clipper. So if you're here for a tutorial on either of those, then maybe you've come to the wrong place. What I do want to convey in this video, though, is that you can do it. You may think that the task of changing the board on your old Ender 3 or whatever printer you have is a daunting task. And I don't know, maybe it is. But it is an approachable one. Especially if you do choose to go with an SKR board like this. And here's why. Instructions. Look. The instructions are really good. So that's my video done. In lieu of a 30 minute tutorial, read the instructions. Seriously. Bye. Okay, fine. Let's have some close ups of the board while I rant a bit. You may note that you can still use the old drivers on this board, and you can also use the new drivers with old boards using an adapter, but that looks a bit meh to me. How tall would your case need to be to fit these in? No, the new board is where it's at with these new drivers. It's about 50 to 70 pounds, I think, to buy the board, depending on your local pricing, which in US dollars is 50 to 70 pounds. Some of you fell for that joke when I did it last time. I put a link below, hopefully, if you want to buy this board, but we should go on and look at some specs, I suppose. If you're used to SKR boards, then a lot of these specs will be absolutely normal to you, but if you come from an 8-bit board um, situation like an old Ender, then this will be all super cool bleeding edge stuff. We have a really high spec chip on this thing, it's running at 480 megahertz, which is crazy fast. I have absolutely no idea what you need a chip this fast for on a 3D printing board, but it's there anyway. It's a genuine STM32 chip, which means it's 32-bit. That's what the 32 stands for, by the way. Cool. You've got just about everything supported on the board through headers. BL Touch, touchscreen support via Serial, SPI, or the old-fashioned Ender type screen that we have here that I'm just going to carry on using. You've got Wi-Fi module support, so you can use an ESP32 type chip, possibly with different leg sort of layout. I'll investigate that at some point because that definitely has to be done. Um, I know that Robin Nano boards support something similar as well. Anyway, you've got RGB light support. Um, yep, it can literally drive RGB lights because why not? Uh, you've got filament detector support, external shutdown. Is that everything? Probably not. In terms of the number of outputs, it's a fairly normal three axis and then potentially two extruders. I suppose you could use one of those for another Z axis in your Marlin config if you're into that, but I'm not doing either. I've got one X, one Y, one Z and one extruder on this machine. Also, we have this system that allows you to separately power the stepper drivers. There are some advantages to running steppers at higher voltages um, than the board is capable of, not the drivers. Uh, the board it runs at 24 volts, um, basically. So they've added this capability to supply up to a crazy 48 volts straight to the driver chips. Of course, you need to choose your driver chips carefully if you want to use this feature because some of them can't handle that kind of voltage and this will damage them. Uh, again, for the purposes of this video, I'm not that bothered about this for a small bed slinger like an Ender. I'm just going to use the 24 volts supplied by the board. Let's move on to fitting the thing. Fitting the board is actually easier than it might appear. You just have to unplug everything from the old Creality board, in this case, and after some choice words, uh, separate out the wires and route them out the back. Of course, your new board will not fit where the old one did because Reality boards are really tiny uh, for reasons, well mainly the reason is because the chips are soldered on so they don't have to make room for the plugs. And yes I know this is a weird Ender 3 I have with a 32-bit board, it, it's not good though trust me, it's not even a silent board. That's a long story for another day. 
So I had a look around, and the best option for a case for the Ender 3 seems to be teaching text case. You can also print it on an Ender, so I definitely advise doing this before your printer is in bits, because it will be quite hard at that point. Unless, of course, you've got spare printers, which obviously I have one or two of those kicking around. So four short prints later, I have the case ready, and I can start assembling the thing. This case is really clever, by the way. Uh, it's really just a matter of putting the wires back in where they should be. It helps if you labelled them when you took them out, um, or at least take pictures of them. It's always a good idea to take pictures before you disassemble things, so you can figure out where everything goes. The only trick with Enders, and I guess this probably applies to other Creality printers too, is that they use two-pin plugs for the end stops, which is non-standard. The standard is three-pin. You should check the wiring yourself rather than trusting me, but this is what I did. At least it's not what I did at first, but eventually I worked it out through trial and error. The board came with a bag of plugs and crimp fittings which you can use to make the necessary plugs. I think from memory I managed to just about poke the fittings out of the old plugs for the end stops and just push them back into the new plugs so that you don't have to re-crimp them. But for some things like the part cooling fan, these were just bare wire that were into a uh, screw terminal. So you probably need a crimping tool anyway, which admittedly is a pain, I agree, but they are worth having anyway. I'll try and link one in the description below if I remember. This is probably a really good time to mention that if you don't know what you're doing, the high current wires especially of the bed and hot end and the input, uh, they are potentially dangerous. Don't do it if you aren't at least confident that you can do it safely. It's not a particularly difficult job, but you need to make sure that it's tightened up and in properly. With everything connected up, uh, there's not a lot else we can do. The screen can go into the bottom of the two ports here, but the chances are nothing will happen if you turn it on. At least it didn't for me. It's time to compile Marlin, which I did first just to see if the thing was working right, because, you know, it's easier to tell if you have an LCD screen that works. Just saying. I did mention that I'm far from a pro at compiling Marlin. Um, I think I mentioned that it's actually the first time I did it, so I'd rather point you to how to do it rather than step through it step by step. Um, plus that would be boring. The manual that is provided is pretty helpful on this, but when it comes down to it, you're downloading VS Code, you're adding two extensions to it, which by the way is really easy because VS Code is that cool, you just add the extensions, you restart and wait for platform IO, platform IO? Platformio to install, and then you just go at it with the example files that SKR give you on their support pages, which I will link below. Two files that you absolutely need to change, well, maybe only one, I think I only changed the one. Um, they are on screen, uh, you're just going through them one by one and reading what each configuration option does and commenting it out, uncommenting it, pretty much that's all you do. And then you do the compile thing, which is just following the steps, and with any luck that will succeed and you're good to go. If you get any error messages, usually the best thing to do is to just calm down and read them and you could usually either figure them out or Google it. Once it's done, stick the firmware file onto an SD card and put it into the board and boot up. When it works, it renames firmware.bin on the card to firmware.cur or something. I think it's firmware.cur. So that's a way to know that it's completed. You also find that some LEDs on the board will briefly flash when it works. And at this point you should have an actual working printer. It prints, with Marlin. I mean that wasn't really so hard, was it? So, Clipper. Can we just skip this bit? No? Really? Okay then. Clipper is a thing of two parts. One part goes on the Raspberry Pi, which, by the way, you need to run Clipper. I know that you can run it on a Commodore 64 or any other vintage telephone exchange hardware that you have lying around. Stop telling me that in the comments. Everyone knows that the best way to run Clipper is a Raspberry Pi. The process is not that hard, actually. The Pi Imager even has an option for it. Make sure you configure the Wi-Fi and username and stuff in the settings so that the Pi can get onto your Wi-Fi. That's a new feature with the Raspberry Pi Imager, relatively new. Uh, it makes things a lot easier. Then once that's flashed, you take that micro SD card and that goes into the Raspberry Pi. You could do this, the instructions are on screen, and that makes a bin file which goes onto the printer. That's the firmware for the printer. Again, Big Tree Tech do provide one of these, and I think it will work, but because I was having SD card issues, it, it got complicated. I made mine using this process, and that's the one I used, so... Flashing that bin to the printer via the SD card should just kind of work, the same way that the Marlin one did a minute ago. Um, although because Clipper doesn't natively support the Ender 3 screen, it won't actually show anything. You have to go to the IP address of the Pi, 
and have a poke around in mainsail. It may just connect to the printer, assuming that you've plugged the cable in between the Pi and the printer, always worth doing. If it doesn't, then you've just got some config to do, and that basically means finding out where the USB is. Once you're connected between the Pi and the Clipper firmware, you still have some work to do before you can actually print anything. And honestly, I didn't enjoy it, and I may have said some choice things on Discord, but there's some stuff on screen that I learned along the way. I did get it printing though in about maybe one to two hours, and this is what popped out, and it looks pretty good. You can look at them side by side, the model on the left was printed in Marlin, the one on the right was printed in Clipper. They both used the exact same G-code. The funny thing is actually, if you use a different SD card for Clipper and Marlin firmware, you kind of can set up a dual boot Ender 3, which is quite cool. Anyway, I can't see a lot of difference between these prints. Of course. Nearly no config has been done in this video on either Marlin or Clipper. Both of them were just very bare bones. I just kind of forced them to work. Uh, we can do some more configuration in a future video, of course. But one thing that did stand out, well, two things really. Actually, maybe even three. I guess it's summary time. Firstly, both of these prints are way better than before I changed the board. Possibly just uh, because mesh levelling is a thing now, and that is a game changer in itself, but even so, maybe Marlin 2 is just better too. That would not be surprising at all. I think the clipper print at the moment just has the edge though, literally. If you look at this part here, you'll hopefully see what I mean. But this isn't a side-by-side -side comparison of clipper's capabilities versus Marlin, because uh, I want to be clear, that's not what I'm trying to achieve here. Secondly, on Marlin, there's loads of new options available in the menu system. You know, like the aforementioned bed mesh thing. I have no idea why manufacturers go to such great lengths to turn this stuff off. Thirdly, the printer is a lot quieter now. And, you know, oddly, the interface on the screen seems to work better too. Maybe this is down to the faster processor. It also completely eliminated the interference issues I was having with this printer, which was kind of making it sort of unusable. So I guess you already know the answer as to whether it's worth doing this upgrade and changing the OG Ender 3 board to a newer one like this. In 2022, that is a hard yes. It is like a new machine. This is way better than it was, and I don't even feel like I need to change the LCD display either on Marlin, because it doesn't even annoy me nearly as much as it did before. So that is about it, I think. Let me know what you think in the comments. All the links are below as usual. I will see you next time. Remember to subscribe, and thank you for watching.